I think it was just like after I had done the first project and I saw the results of it, I wasn't showing anyone, it was just for myself. Like it was like a high and I was like, I wanna keep figuring this out as I go. In 2017, a 23-year-old designer in Boston had an idea. Nicole McLaughlin had taken an entry-level design job at Reebok, but exposure to the waste inherent in the manufacturing of apparel inspired her to embark on a series of art projects in her off hours. She crafted clever one-of-one -one footwear out of found objects like tennis balls and badminton paraphernalia. Her work soon gained a cult following. And as her audience exploded on social media, she started her own company centered on art and upcycling, teaching workshops and partnering with blue chip brands on a variety of environmentally conscious design forward projects, including collaborations with Reebok and Vans. And it all started with one idea. How did your parents' professional life inform your career ambitions? My parents are both pretty creative people, so I feel like I was always around it my whole life. My dad was a carpenter, and then he ended up becoming a mall manager, so he was sort of around fashion. And then my mom has always been an interior designer for commercial spaces, so from like my earliest memories, there was always carpet samples and like chairs in the back seat of the car. And there was always something creative happening in my house. Like they were very crafty and also really good at working with what they had. So I feel like that definitely has influenced a lot of the decisions that I make as a designer. When would you say that you sort of fell in love with graphic design? I got a MacBook when I was in high school and I got a cracked version of Illustrator and Photoshop and that's really when I started doing editing and doing some stuff on Illustrator. But I think once I got to college, that's really when I started to learn more about graphic design and that I realized also that it could be done for clothing too. Who were the designers or what were the sort of brands or products that were most influential on you in that high school period? My fashion sense was pretty interesting. I was more into like skateboarding and snowboarding, so I wore a lot of Vans and I loved Burton. And then also during high school, I was really into sign language, so I had a deaf relationship when I was in high school. And I spent a lot of time on YouTube, like watching videos of people signing. And so YouTube was really helpful. I wasn't like the best student, so I think I learned a lot from other people or watching other people do stuff. And that definitely still applies today. I get creative blocks a lot. And I find that the best way to get through it is to just continue to create. I find that sometimes it's helpful if I paint something or I take photos, you know, taking a step back and doing something else that's creative. What do you feel like was like the most important things that you learned in college? It allowed me some time to grow and to meet people and try different things. And I landed in digital media and it was a pretty broad m major that allowed you to just kind of explore all different forms of doing photography, doing videography, sound recording. And I really appreciated that time. And there was also a lot of equipment that I could use for not for free, but essentially to me for free, I was like, oh, I can use all this equipment. And I really took advantage of that. And that's how I learned all the programs and things I needed for my time at Reebok. Did you have any sort of sense of what you wanted to do as a career at that point? I always was like tinkering and using my hands to make stuff, but I never would have thought that what I do now is even a possibility. Like I knew the fashion industry existed and I, I liked fashion, but I didn't really understand that as like a career choice, especially with footwear and graphics being applied to garments or to footwear. So I found this internship working for Reebok and I, I just applied to it. I had no idea. Like I thought I'd be doing graphics for uh, social media or graphics that were meant for advertisements. And then once I got there, I learned that I was doing graphics for clothing. 
And that was like the craziest experience to learn how the fashion industry works and understand how clothes are made. But once I learned all those things, I was like, this is definitely more of the direction that I want to go in. When you applied for the internship at Reebok, was this a paid internship? It was paid, which was great. And I got to, I moved to Boston. So that was a really big change um, from college to then moving to a new city. It was all really exciting, but really nerve wracking. And I knew it was kind of my chance to prove myself and like get into the industry. So I didn't waste a second of it. And I worked really hard that whole year. And what, what kinds of stuff did they have you making? I was doing graphics for running. That was what I was placed on. So I was doing repeat patterns for tights, for shoes. And then I got put on this project, which at the time I didn't even realize like how much this would impact me, but it, Reebok started doing collaborations um, with some fashion brands and Vet Mall at the time was just kind of taking off and they did a collab with Reebok on an Insta Pump Fury. So I had to take this shoe that Demna essentially scribbled all over, had to take it apart and recreate it all in Photoshop to be able to make it factory ready and so that they could make it in mass production. And it took me weeks and weeks and weeks and I was like sleeping at the office and stuff. And yeah, it's kind of where it all started. I like the idea of luck. And I think a lot of the people in this industry say that luck is somehow a factor in their success, whether it's being at the right place at the right time or discovering something at that moment. But there's also just the layer of being perceptive to things and pushing yourself to do the best you can do. How does one transition from this sort of one year internship program to becoming a full-time employee there. It was kind of crazy because they put us all against each other. It was like all your friends that you sat next to for a whole year and they're like, get to know each other. And then they're like, there's like one job. So you all have to fight for it now. And I think my competitive spirit really came out and I was like, I'm going to get this job because I'm not moving back home with my parents in New Jersey. So I used that experience and I, I built my portfolio and I was thankful I got the job. And so I was hired full time doing graphics for Reebok Classics, which was where I wanted to be because it was all the really cool, exciting products that had the collaborations, but also referenced all the archive stuff. And Reebok has an amazing history. It was really cool to have that experience. I got to do some cool stuff. I got to do like throwback Allen Iverson jerseys and make all the cool graphics and stuff for inline apparel. At what point in this journey did you start working on your own personal art projects? So I had been working at Reebok a couple of years before I started doing my personal projects. I started to realize how much waste there was coming out of the industry. I would be sitting at my desk and there would be boxes of samples just surrounding me and it's a half a pair that's the wrong color, the wrong material, so it kind of is just destined to be trashed and thrown out. And so I started to rummage and pick through these things that they were just gonna get rid of and taking them home with me. Like not really knowing what I was gonna do, but I was like, I could maybe try to find a way to use this. I first started hot gluing everything. And then from there I was like, well, what if I hand sew it? And then I got better at every project. When I say where my ideas come from, it sounds a little bit corny, but they really do come from everywhere. I think a lot of the time material is used only for its intended purpose, so I like to try to change that. You're a young person in a new city. I imagine you are pursuing an active social life and you have like other things going on and you're also working your ass off at your job. Where's the motivation coming from to be like, oh, I'm gonna spend like 12 hours at home tinkering with this thing or teaching myself to sew without a concrete end in mind. I look back at that time and I, I think it was just like after I had done the first project and I saw the results of it, I wasn't showing anyone, it was just for myself. It made me feel really good and inspired. And I was like, I wanna keep, like it was like a high. And I was like, I wanna keep figuring this out. Like what if I get better? And like, what if I just keep taking new materials and, and figuring this out as I go. On the weekends, I would go out and try to 
rummage through thrift stores and my house and everywhere. Reebok had an office in Canton that they closed and I would go back there and try to find materials and take it home with me. The energy was just so high at the time too. How long did it take from sort of starting to like acquire these skills to getting to a place where you're even showing friends? I'd say a year probably. I was making this stuff just in my bedroom, not showing anybody. And then I would show like some friends and then I would be working on stuff at my desk occasionally because it was like starting to take over my life where it was like the only thing I was thinking of. And then I started posting it on social. And one of like my first ones that I felt good about that I posted it, someone was like, oh, like was this an actual shoe? And I was like, oh wow, that's like such a crazy compliment because I went from hot gluing something to making something that looked like it could actually have been made. And so from then I was just like, oh, I can just, you know, keep sharing this and show the progress of me making stuff. And then a couple months after that, I made a series where I did a shoe out of a tennis ball, a shoe out of a volleyball, and a shoe out of a soccer ball. And that's when I started to like pick up traction on like social and followers and it was really scary, honestly. I was not prepared for it, and I didn't realize how fast that could happen. It was exciting, but also I was like, do I have what it takes to continue doing this? And like, am I doing it for me, or am I doing it for them now? This was always a creative side project, and I never wanted to lose that. It was a pretty fast switch. Like Once all the traction started, I was like, oh, wow, I have to be taking this serious. After getting her first taste of public success, Nicole continued to expand on her tradecraft, including honing her skills at the legendary Adidas Creators Farm. As her unique passion projects continued to attract attention, she recognized an opportunity to step out on her own and found a company that could encompass the breadth of her upcycling ambition, from collabs to consulting to education. During your time at Reebok, you ended up going to work um, at the farm in Adidas, the parent company of Reebok, um, work with Mark Dolce, who's you know sort of a design god. What was that experience like and how was it different than the experience within Reebok? The farm was this Disneyland for designers. Basically, it's, it was an office where people could come and they had an unlimited resource of materials and a maker space and knowledgeable people who worked in there. The designers from Adidas would come and they would do a three month rotation. And I was the first Reebok designer that got offered the opportunity to do the rotation at the farm. So I was really, really excited for that. And at the time I had just really started, you know, doing my personal projects. I was in such a creative space filled with so many creative people that were almost on this like sabbatical thing. So, so you, yeah, are you working on like projects that are meant to come to fruition or is it more sort of like a R&D like experimental thing? A bit of both, but definitely more with the intention of like creating projects. Yeah, that would come out in maybe three or four years time. It was pretty advanced like timeline. And so, yeah, that was just like a knowledge explosion during that time and sewing that that was like where I really got my skill set. My biggest advantage as a creator is to be able to show what goes on in my mind physically. I think it's a visual representation of my thoughts. As you start to have these viral moments. Is this something that is talked about at Reebok with your manager, with your team? And <laughs> The majority of the people I worked with had no idea that this was happening. And then there was one time, and this was the moment that I knew it was time to quit. Um, I was in a meeting and this outside marketing agency came in to do like a presentation to Reebok and they put me in a deck and were like, oh, you should collaborate with this girl. And I was sitting in the meeting and all my coworkers like turned and looked at me and I was like, okay, I guess I have to, I gotta do something about that. I never thought that I would do freelance. I never thought I would own a business. I didn't understand anything about it. I was kind of scared actually to even consider that. Cause in my head I was like, oh, I've made it. Like I have a, like a corporate job that has like a name and you know, I've worked really hard to get here, but 
And I knew that I wasn't, I'm not always gonna have, you know, the most popular social media. I'm not always gonna be the most relevant and I'm totally fine with that. But the moments that you do have it, it's kind of like a make or break thing where it's like, if you want to use this moment, use it and capitalize on it. And so I was like, let's do it. Making things the way that you do, and they're all, you know, sort of one of ones, or at least at that, in that moment, it was all one of ones. The obvious path towards monetizing that would be to go and sell them and figure out whether, you know, it's on some sort of marketplace or whatever. You were very pointed in not wanting to sell these pieces. What was the sort of motivation philosophically to not have any sort of commercial element with the personal projects? First of all, it's really challenging to make these pieces sometimes and like at scale, if I was to sit there and make even only 10 or 20 versions of this, First of all, it's never gonna look exactly the same every time. Something about it's gonna feel different. And a lot of the time the material I use, there is only one I could find of it. And sometimes I'm using mismatched soles or you know, different parts of things and it's hard to duplicate what I do. Something that I always realized as, as a consumer myself, like you see stuff online and like immediately you're like, oh, I like that, I wanna buy it. And I don't feel like everything needs to be purchased and so a lot of the pieces that I have that are a bit like crazier, wilder, like you wouldn't have the same experience even if you did own it. Like I think it's something about what you get when you see it, you have it, you feel it and then you know you kind of keep moving on with your day. You'll come back and look at it or reference it or however but you don't need to own it to have an experience with it. How, you know, as you are thinking, I'm going to quit my job and pursue running my own, you know, myself as a business kind of, how were you thinking about monetizing it and making it work financially? It started actually with the workshops. So that was my first opportunity as a freelancer was like, oh, well, why don't you teach people how to sew? Like, if that's what you know how to do. And again, like I had just started this, like I was not an expert, but I was like, I can teach people. Like if I could figure this out, like people can do this. I had that as an opportunity. And then my first like bigger brand project was with a extension of Foot Locker. It was called Greenhouse. And they offered me a project to do a collaboration with Crocs. And so I was like, okay, like I didn't know what that really meant. And I was like, can this be scaled in a way that still feels like me, that still has a part of my identity and the ethos of upcycling, knowing that it's still, it's gonna be created new. How can I make this me? And so that's sort of where it started. And I saw a business opportunity and then I started to realize I can work with these companies from the inside out. So my experience from Reebok really can apply here where it's like these brands have all this stuff and I know it because I've seen it how can we find a way to use it can we bring this back into production can we do workshops you know there's to me it was dollar signs because it's material that they're ready to throw away and I was like if I can make something cool out of it like I'll take it and I'll I'll use it and then they're like well how can we get involved in it my ultimate creative goal is to make upcycling a more popular thing, to be able to show the potential of waste and to show that the fashion industry as a whole can do a lot better. What was the process for putting together kind of the itinerary or the curriculum for the workshops? The workshops have always been more, how can someone leave with a skill that they didn't have when they came. And I always thought that sewing was really scary. And I like sometimes I still think sewing's kind of scary. And if you've like been in front of a sewing machine before, it's like there's a lot of power that you hold in your hands and you're like, I don't really know what I'm doing. I want them to leave with the finished product, but if anything, if they could leave with some type of skill set, even if it is hand sewing, just to be able to understand how something is made, I think is important. That can leave with them being able to repair something or be able to hem a pair of pants that they've thrifted. If we work with a brand, it's a sponsored moment where they'll provide a box of shoe samples or dead stock fabric or clothes that are donated back to them and we'll use that. And it's cool because they get to have the discovery element of taking something and flipping it inside out, finding pockets, finding pullers and using everything that you can because it's valuable. You left Reebok in 2019 and started this business sort of in earnest 
uh, going right into the pandemic. How did that affect kind of getting things off the ground? That was really scary. I think that was like the craziest time to decide to go freelance. I was really nervous to make that jump. And then once that happened too, I was like, what am I gonna do? And also because my well of materials just kind of, it dried up because I didn't have Reebok materials and all the thrift stores and things that I was going to to get materials, I didn't have during COVID either. So it really forced me to dig super deep and I was just using literally everything in my house and I was getting really creative with the stuff that I had. And this is also around the time that I started taking apart all the projects that I was making. So I was like, I'll make it, I'll take a picture of it, I'll take it apart, and then I can use that material again for another project. So a lot of the stuff that I've made, like you've probably seen it and you're like, oh, that's actually, that's the same sole, like that's the same fleece material that's been used, you know, at this point dozens of times. So I think it was a really good thing to happen um, and also started to realize I needed to create boundaries between me and my work too. I think as a freelancer, you start to realize like you, you run a business that becomes your whole entire life and you're never able to turn it off. I was experiencing a lot of burnout. Then I was like, if I don't set these healthy boundaries now, will I ever? That was also a time of reflection for me to be able to do that. Striking out on her own just as the pandemic began would force Nicole to expand her DIY toolkit even further. Her technical skills and philosophy regarding the creative process would provide a broad foundation for success, culminating with a satisfying full circle moment. I think it's interesting just hearing the language used that you you frame it as going freelance as opposed to like launching a brand or starting a company. Do you still feel like you are like a freelance designer or do you feel like you are, you know, the captain of this enterprise? I've legitimized the operation, so I I should have I should graduate from the the term freelancer, but for some reason in my head I'm mentally kind of still there. I don't feel big enough, I guess, to be a brand, but at this point, like I am creating stuff that people are wearing and buying, so in a way, like that's sort of how it is. And I I am an LLC and I pay people, and so. It is a bigger ship than, I'm like still thinking it's a sailboat, I guess, and it's <laughs> actually like a ship. But I like mentally kind of keeping it still as like my personal project. I don't want to lose that. I'm like scared that I'm going to lose that because that's why I love it so much. And it's mine and I care about it. And I don't want it to become so big that it's like a machine. How would you describe your brand? I have a couple of different arms of it where my personal work is still the forefront. That's where I get my ideas. I still love dedicating my time to making things and trying things out and knowing that it's probably not gonna work. And then I have these brand projects where it's a collaboration and it's footwear, it's apparel, they come to me, they have an idea for a model of a shoe and I'm like, okay, well, what material do you have that's potentially destined for the trash like can we use that can we do a super small run and, and we can do a really like small customizable version of it and make it a little bit crazier i think it's more about still upcycling is at the forefront of everything and making responsible design choices when it comes to sourcing materials but whimsy and fun is also a big part of my brand and my identity is playfulness and putting pockets on things that don't maybe necessarily need a pocket, but I think it does. What are the qualities about yourself that you hold on to the most tightly? My childhood sense of wonder. I think that's always been a huge part of my work and just my life. I love to have fun and I don't always love to take things too seriously especially being in an industry that is pretty serious at times. I think it's always fun to approach it with a lightheartedness and that's what's kind of kept me going. A lot of the work you do is with brands, which means that you have to sort of interface with people there and they have their own agenda and their expectations that always at the outset of these relationships 
are aligned, at least on paper. But then as it plays out, sometimes there's, it reveals a uh, misalignment. Yeah, I've definitely experienced that. I'd say the majority of the time, the brands that I work with kind of know what they're signing up for. And I'm not, I'm not a safe designer in any aspect of like the process. I like to sort of push my limits and also the company that I'm working with limits on what they've made in the past and what we can create together that feels authentic to both of us. But I think having the design integrity and also identity for me is really important to keep secure. Brands will come to me now for advice, which I love, and they're like, we don't know what to do with all this stuff. We have a box that's sitting in the warehouse. It's costing us more money to have it in the warehouse than it would be to get rid of it. Let's call Nicole. Like, like what kind of things would that be? It's crazy. Like things that don't even make it onto the floor at a store because the tag on the clothes like maybe created a small hole in it. Even if like there was a couple pieces like that, they'll get sent back. So like it's not even noticeable to a consumer. Or if a roll of fabric has like one water marker, some type of like ink mark on one part of the roll, the whole thing will get scrapped. Just like wear testing. They could be halfway through like producing a shoe and then something fails on it. And they're like, mm, actually, nope, we gotta take everything off the factory line and figure this out. That's a big part of what I've been doing now. I love that type of work. And a lot of the time the brand partnerships start as like, a social media ask and then have turned into this whole like I'm like let me take a look at your factory and your business and let's see what we could do here and definitely overstepping boundaries as much as I possibly can. How do you think about the content that you're making and you know the upside of social media is the interconnectedness and the fact that we can reach so many people. The downside is that yes you know that you're in a feedback loop even if you're trying to fight being in that feedback loop. I think at some point I had to tune it out. It's nice to be able to create a place for conversation and I like that and I always, I leave, comments are always on because I want people to have a dialogue but at the same time you shouldn't let what people say always influence the decisions that you're making and over time I was like you know what people are gonna have their opinions whether they like it or not they're thinking about it, they're commenting on it and I think the ultimate me like message that I'm trying to achieve is getting people's perception around waste and you know the the bad side of the fashion industry I, I want people to change their minds about this stuff and so as long as they're interacting with it some way it's helpful I think I think to be able to tell a good idea from a bad idea you have to do both and I definitely have experienced a lot of bad ideas and they somehow always lead me in the right direction, so I just kind of have to let it happen. Has there ever been a project that you've made and felt so good about and confident in and then posted it and had it not connect? A while ago, I had all this um, material from Puma and it was samples that were made for the Olympics and it was like track spikes and balls and gloves and all these like things that were meant to be for sport and I it was a sculptural piece and it wasn't really meant to be wearable but it was meant to be more for display my idea was to make like art like a series of armor out of all these like track spikes on like the arms and like I think that was definitely like one of those times where I was like, oh wow, okay. Like conceptual doesn't always hit with the audience, but to me, it really pushed my design skills. And also I got a lot of projects out of it. I had so many people reference, like brands that came to me after that referenced that, that image. And they were like, this was like a sculpture. Like we want something like this. And I ended up doing um, a sculpture for the Super Bowl last year for Nike because of that project. And it was just kind of crazy that that happened. So I always say like people that aren't really sure about if they should post something or if they think it's too out there, or, like not their normal style, like go for it anyway, because like who cares about metrics at the end of the day, if it's gonna get you work and it's gonna get you, you know, the right people's attention, you never know. So it worked out. Obviously as the business has grown and the opportunities have grown, 
you don't physically make every single thing with your hands anymore. You now have people that you work with. How has it been to sort of detach yourself from the physicality of that part of the creation? It's challenging. I never thought that I would give that part of it up, but at some point I had to, to be able to be a business person and be able to go and take meetings and go places and, and keep things running. Because it used to be, if I had to travel somewhere, everything stopped and I had to, I was sewing in hotel rooms and like it, it wasn't working for me. So I found people that I really trust and that understand me and my vision, but also they have their own vision as well and how we can work together. And I think I still have a hand in, in everything, um, it, whether that's the concept is usually coming, that's me usually. And the physical making part of it could be passed off to other people, but it's, it's ours. Like it still feels like a part of me because it came from my brain and you know, just because I didn't sit there and physically sew the whole thing. But that was a, a big letting go moment. And I think a lot of people experience that as a, you know, creative, but in, in any business sense where it's like you were the one doing every job and at some point it's like you can't physically do everything. So you're going to have to be able to delegate and I've gotten better at it, but it's always something that I'm working on. The most important idea that I've ever had is letting go. I think for me, my projects are meant to live in a moment of time and I never stay stuck on one thing. You have established yourself very prominently in the footwear industry without necessarily coming into it as a sneakerhead or real like sneaker enthusiast. What would you say is your sort of relationship to sneakers at this point? I do love sneakers and I, yeah, I didn't grow up a sneakerhead per se. I mean, I always thought about my footwear choices, but it was always more from a utility standpoint and it's still a lot of the time is. What has brought me closer to them is the history of shoes and how inspiring that is to me. Reebok's first running shoe ever was like the first running shoe and was a literal like nails as track spikes. If you even think about it, like the first like women's athletic shoe was came out in the 80s, like designed specifically for women. And like, that's not that long ago, you know? It's like, it's pretty crazy to realize like that we're in this moment. So I think that's what really gets me excited about footwear. I love being able to contribute to that in some way. And yeah, just seeing brands that are coming up with really innovative things. And yeah, I just, I love that part of it. You are wearing um, a collaboration that you've recently released uh, with Reebok with your name on it. This was a huge full circle moment for me from being a literal intern at the brand to having a shoe. I just never would have thought in my wildest dreams, the scared intern that was afraid of everything uh, and to now. They came to me with the model and it was a women's specific model. Uh, it's called the Geo Mid. And I really loved it. I just thought it was customizable. There was a good canvas for me to work off of. And it reminded me of this shoe from the 90s called the Etna Mid. And it's funny because that's really where I pulled a lot of the inspiration from. And I got to utilize my knowledge of the Reebok archive to be able to design my shoe and also utilize my knowledge of the company as a whole, like the development team and the marketing team who I had worked with in the past. So it was like, we don't need to be introduced because I know you already. Um, and so it just worked really well having that experience and being able to kind of put myself to the test. But yeah, my parents could not believe that I had my name on a shoe. That was a really cool moment. They were like, you, your name is on there. Like that's Do wild. they have pairs? They do, my mom has a pair. Nice. She's been sporting it, yeah. What else is on the bucket list? I definitely want to get more into homewares and furniture. That was something that I've, I've dabbled in the past couple years. 
an ultimate dream of mine would be to have a kids like a children's museum and have it be more of like a museum of science or like an experimental type of place where people like can come and touch and create and make things so like almost like my workshops but in a larger sense and kid friendly and also I have some really crazy projects coming up that I'm excited about and it is really it wasn't like dipping a toe within the footwear industry I'm like fully submerging myself <laughs> in it so I'm really excited to see how it goes and also how every project we can do can be closer to being a fully upcycled shoe that's really the goal that's honestly like within a five-year plan is to work with a brand to do an, an entirely upcycled shoe at scale like not just a hundred pairs like a thousand or a couple thousand plus pairs of shoes Thank you.